Africa, Dituno, Kena, Datiaono, Diri, Mukaro, Aguibana, Borjero, Boriken, Taino, Daka. Uh, greetings, relatives. My name is uh, Roberto Mucaro Borrero. I'm a Boriken Taino representing the United Confederation of Taino People. And it's an honor to serve as moderator for today's IITC webinar, Protecting and Restoring Our Traditional Food and Ecosystems, Practical Knowledge Sharing with Indigenous Peoples, Session 6, Traditional Building Materials and Methods. Now, I'm just going to uh, quickly just say that in Spanish. Uh, saludos y bienvenidos, hermanas y hermanos. Mi nombre es Roberto Mucaro Borrero. Soy del pueblo Taíno y tengo el honor de servir como moderador de este webinario de City, Protección y Restauración de Nuestros Alimentos y eco Ecosistemas Tradicionales, Intercambio de Conocimientos con los Pueblos Indígenas, Sesión 6, Materiales y Métodos de Construcción Tradicionales. Now, uh, I'm, voy a volver en inglés para explicar la función de interpretación de la plataforma de Zoom, primero en inglés y después en español. All right, so right now I'm going to just uh, quickly run over the Zoom interpretation feature. We do have uh, uh, interpretation in Spanish available today. So I will just uh, attempt to share my screen here. All right, you should be able to see my screen right now uh, with the images of the interpretation. If you go to the bottom right of your screen, you'll see a little globe. Underneath the globe, it says interpretation. You want to uh, click on the language that, that you want to hear, which is uh, for this will be English. You'll select English and then mute original audio. Here's an image so you can see what that looks like. Select the language, English, or and then mute original audio. So make sure that you do both those things so you don't hear uh, both the speaker interpretation. All right, right now I'm going to uh, switch this over to uh, the Spanish version of this so that we could just make sure everybody is on point with the instructions. Okay, bueno, ahora voy a explicar uh, los instrucciones uh, para la uh, función de interpretación de la plataforma de Zoom. Primero, localiza el icono de interpretación. Está en la parte inferior derecha de su pantalla. Aquí es una imagen. Puede ver un globito. Uh, abajo de eso dice Interpretation. Sele seleccione después de eso Español. Después de la selección de Español, seleccione Mute Original Audio, que quiere decir apague el audio original. So, primero, Seleccione Español, después Mute Original Audio o apaga el audio original. Voy a volver en inglés ahora porque tenemos interpretación. Okay, I'm going to stop my uh, screen share and we're going to uh, begin our, our webinar um, right now. I have the a pleasure and honor to introduce Andrea Carmen from the Yaqui Nation. She's the Executive Director of the International Indian Treaty Council. And she's going to be uh, giving an introduction of today's webinar. Andrea, you have the floor. Choco Tessia, Roberto, and uh, respectful greetings uh, to everyone that's here. Leo Simchaniabo, Umawayaim. And we are very honored to have a distinguished panel of experts. And I say experts very deliberately. Um, the United Nations uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Article 31, um, affirms our right to maintain, control, and develop our traditional culture, cultural expressions, our sciences, and our technologies. And certainly what our experts are sharing today is examples of indigenous technologies that are especially important, not just for our sovereignty and our cultural rights, but also um, for practical methods to survive uh, the current double crisis we're in, not just the pandemic, but kind of the f more far reaching and long lasting and uh, worsening crisis called the climate crisis or climate change. Uh, going back to our traditional 
building and construction methods um, are directly relevant to our survival in this regard. And I think that the panelists are going to be talking about that as well. Uh, the United Nations has a branch uh, or an agency within it called UN Habitat. And they have regular international global conferences called um, UN Habitat or the World Urban Forum. And I was actually invited to be, I think, the only Indigenous speaker um, at the last uh, World Urban Forum that happened right before the pandemic set in and all of our travels were curtailed. But it was in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates, um, which I'd never been to uh, that part of the world. So it was very interesting. And one of the traditional tribal leaders, actually the whole country is made up of, I think, eight different um, emirates or, or tribal um, governments and uh, the men wear the long white um, gowns with, you know, with, with white scarves and quite impressive um, looking. And, and after my presentation, where I talked a little bit about uh, our building methods and techniques uh, in the time of climate change, one of them asked me if the government of the United States had actually began to incorporate some of indigenous people's uh, traditional building models, because they're doing that there in the desert. They're looking at their traditional tribal building methods and how they can be applied to modern buildings to uh, decrease the impacts of climate change and keep the need for uh, especially air conditioning down um, in a very hot climate where they are in the desert. Uh, and it really reminded me of, of here when he was talking about it, but I had to say I couldn't think of one example where our knowledge is respected in that way and actually incorporated. They copy how it looks, you know, the, the Pueblo style houses with the logs coming out, but I don't think they, they copy the knowledge that, um, or even have tried to reach out to uh, see if we're willing to share those things. And again, you know, sharing is always based on free prior informed consent. So I really thank everybody who's going to be speaking today. Um, and with those thoughts, I want to pass on the time to our panel of distinguished experts. And these are just some of the examples that we could have called on uh, already. We've been asked to have a second webinar um, with some other examples from other uh, other nations, um, but I'm really pleased to be able to present this presentation. I've never seen one like it, uh, so I hope that everybody else will enjoy uh, some, some knowledge and respect away. So thank you very much for the introduction, and I turn back over to you, Roberto, uh, to introduce our first speaker. Joe Thank you very much, Andrea, for that introduction and uh, sharing that wonderful story. Uh, right now, we're going to introduce our first speaker uh, for uh, this webinar. We're going to introduce, uh, I'm introducing right now, uh, Rodney Factor. He's of the uh, Tusekia Harjo Band. He's chief uh, and also a Seminole Sovereignty Protection Initiative. He's from the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. Now, um, Rod, Rodney, whenever you're ready, unmute yourself and you have the floor. Welcome. Hello. Yes, like you said, uh, Rodney Factor, uh, Seminole Nation of Oklahoma, current band chief of uh, Oconee's uh, Tusco Harjo Band. Uh, I was asked to speak about some of our housing, in particular chickies, and I wanted to uh, uh, relay that, you know, um, uh, first contact uh, was recorded that a lot of the southeastern tribes lived in uh, what was kind of being discussed earlier, uh, a wattle and daub style of housing, along with rectangular uh, housing made of logs. Uh, as time went on and our people, a lot of them moved into the Florida areas and we referred to as Seminole. And they also lived in the same type of housing in northern Florida. And uh, uh, the war started uh, with the first and second Seminole War. Our people started to uh, move further south in, uh, into the swampy areas, uh, Everglades, and some of those other areas. And 
that's when the Chicky was actually developed as a uh, housing. Uh, <clears throat> they used the uh, natural uh, elements that were uh, at that time, uh, the palm leaves. Uh, Looks like we just lost uh, Rodney. Yeah, we lost Rodney. Um, Roberto, I, I can come in and say what the pictures are of. Um, yeah. OK, um, yeah, can we we'll try to get Rodney back. He told us that um, this is a picture of Rodney. Um, and he, he told us that uh, he, he was going to be challenged. They were coming a storm in Oklahoma. This is our, our treaty conference, our 40th anniversary treaty conference that we had um, in Okima, Oklahoma. Um, it's the homeland of the Muscogee Creek, um, which is a neighbor um, nation. Oh, here we have Rodney back again. OK, I was just explaining. Yeah, I was they're building a Seminole Cheeky on Muscogee Creek land for our treaty conference. Oh, uh, yeah, that, that came out good. And like I was saying that, you know, uh, as our people moved into those areas and they were pursued by the by the armies of the United States and they used those structures, you know, and uh, they were uh, open on four sides. Uh, the poles were with cypress and the, the roofs were uh, thatched with uh, palmetto leaves where they were folded over and and secured down. And uh, they were uh, able to escape, you know, uh, from either direction if uh, they had to. Uh, like I said, there were no walls. And so they wasn't confined to coming out one door. And uh, they would move to another area. And, uh, of course, uh, the same material was available. And they started again, you know, to build uh, the chickies. And, uh, but as our people were captured and brought to Oklahoma as uh, prisoners of war, then of course we adopted a different type of housing. Uh, but the Florida Seminoles, they continued with that housing until later when modern material became more available. But I understand now that, I mean, I know that there's still some that uh, live in those areas and use the chicky and it became a tourist attraction where a lot of those are being built down there on uh, resorts, uh, understand golf courses and different things. Uh, with that material, uh, they lasted uh, up to 10 to 15 years. And I understand they had to be rethatched probably every five years. So they were a durable structure with the material that they used. Uh, they could withstand uh, hurricanes, you know, and some of these other things, uh, forces of nature. But right now, you know, uh, like I said, I understand that, you know, they're being uh, used uh, for uh, those kind of things, tourist attractions. And here in Oklahoma, we have had the opportunity and, and I had uh, uh, some that have been down in that area to, uh, to build chickies, uh, like Andrea was saying, with our, out with our, uh, our treaty conference there at the Roundhouse, there was a chickie built there and here at the Seminole Nation, uh, we have a chicky built here and we have them built every now and then, you know, just to, to uh, show, you know, the kind of housing that they had. But I know a lot of people think of Seminoles and housing and first thing they think is chickies, you know. And like I said, uh, those uh, shelters came as a, a matter of survival, you know, when we were uh, at war with the United States. I mean, I, I'm not sure if uh, because of the the, um, the disruption before is, uh, are you ending your presentation there or I'm not sure if I'm just not hearing you. Uh, yeah, I was pretty much, I was pretty close to the end, you know, just talking about, you know, uh, how those uh, chickies, you know, they're still used and, and uh, we have them today. Uh, a lot of them are built without the platforms, but my computer's starting to blink off and on, you know, and, uh, 
I don't know, you know, what the deal is, but uh, I think I got the, uh, you know, the point across of uh, the kind of housing that we used. And now we're looking at um, Muskogee Creeks here recently uh, built a structure of Waddle and Daub, you know, going back to uh, uh, those areas in North Florida and, uh, and uh, around Georgia and Alabama that was used for housing and uh, cultural preservation here with the Seminole Nation. They're doing some of the well, thank you so much, Rodney. We really appreciate uh, those words. Uh, I have to say, you know, coming from uh, the Taino people, the Chiquis are very similar to what we would call Cane and, and Boio using that thatch style roofing. And, and as you said, even in my own community, uh, they were known to withstand hurricanes and, and they were, uh, those early colonists were pretty impressed with the structure. So I really appreciate uh, you sharing that and uh, sharing some photos uh, of the Chiqui process. And thank you, Andrea, for stepping in a little bit while we had that disruption uh, of uh, Rodney's internet. So we wanna get right into our next speaker. Uh, really, it's, uh, Andrea will come back. I, I don't know, Andrea, if you just wanna do a, just a quick introduction of, of this. Our next speaker, uh, really who will be going through this is gonna be featured via video. And uh, that's Angel Valencia who is uh, from the Yaki Nation. He's a founder of North-South Indigenous Network Again, Against Pesticides in Arizona. Andrea, I don't know if you wanna add anything before we begin the video? Sure, I, I will. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, the, the, the construction process that he's gonna be showing is mainly filmed at our house here out in the desert uh, west of Tucson. And I just wanted to add one thing also about the Chiquis. Um, when we had our treaty conference in Florida hosted by uh, the sovereign traditional um, Seminole Nation of Florida, we were able to assist them with construction of a lot of Chiquis there. And we were informed that just right before, the year before had been one of the big hurricanes that had uh, knocked down a lot of buildings in town and uh, the, the um, government people came out to their community and told them that they needed to evacuate and they refused and they said that none of their cheekies um, blew down in the hurricane they just picked up the side walls and the wind just blew right through them and they they stayed standing so I think you know just uh, and some of the comments that uh, Angel is going to make in the video also talk about how um, how we need to adapt with the, the climate crisis, you know, bringing back some of these ways that maybe we don't use as much anymore, but we need to take a second look at them in the same way we're taking a second look at our traditional seeds and food. Um, so with that, we can we can start the video. And uh, I want to thank Angel and Chris for helping, but also Alejandro, um, who's the filmmaker. Um, who helped us put this this film together? On hell's at work right now, so we're we're showing him by video. Plus, I think it would be hard to demonstrate on Zoom how to make adobe. So, um, thank you, um, and I hope you enjoy the video. And it's in Spanish, so uh, make sure those who are listening in English uh, uh, get the interpretation. Press the English button on your interpretation icon. Hola, buenas tardes. Hello, good afternoon. Valencia. My name is Angel Valencia, and I'm here to share with you some of my experience of what my, my grandparents and my parents taught me, the importance of making adobe. Adobe is a very essential element for our community because that way you can make your little houses from adobe de, de cómo se hacen los and the process of how adobe eh, is made is the following de caballo. you use manure Por ejemplo, it's horse manure es manur de caballo. for example Nada más de caballo this porque is de, the horse manure otro animal, and that's the only one that we use because equivas, from other no, animals no, from no, cows no, or goats no, se quiebran, se it doesn't work Por eso es importante de que they break el up, they fall de, apart, so de de it's important that the material be from horse manure, ejemplo, and it has to be measured. For example, 
right now. I just finished this process and this is already uh, ready to start to make a, a sample, a, an example of how we make the adobe. You have to have a mold to start with. That's very important. First having a mold before you start to mix it up or making the adobe without the mold, that can't be done. So here, this young man is going to do this process for us. If you can mix it up and put it here into the wheelbarrow, please. Los adobes también cuando se construye una casita no necesita, also, no necesita de refrigeración, no, no, no necesita de calentón. You don't even need any kind of cooling system son, or heating muy, system. Muy fresquito en tiempo de because it is material that is really cool when it's hot, it gets, it keeps the house cool and then, and when it's cold, it keeps the house warm. So you don't, you don't really need much help. Um, and also to protect them, since it's made from soil and manure and water, that's it. So you have to protect it from water. I brought the soil from over here about a hundred feet de un rancho. distance. Así es que si, and the manure I got from a ranch. So that's the process that you have to do. Este es molde, and then you have to have an abundance de of, of water. Este es and this is the mold que, that you have to use. This is cuatro, cuatro a mold that si is made up leer, of si by a friend. It's made up, es it, de, made up so that you can make four hacer, adobes. Y tener un área como este, and como you este can que ven aquí. do this have an area like this little piece no here. You can use mucho, this area. Mucho, it's an area piedra, mucho, that can be clean no so that no you don't have, clean, have a lot of nada. dirt or nothing, que, que that there's no no kind of stickers or es que sticks or anything. It has to be completely clean. Se va a utilizar, and so se I'm going to clean mojado. it up a little bit. Entonces, yo voy a hacer esto. Because every time no that cabe, it's going to be used, you need to wet it. It doesn't fit, but I'll see how I can manage it. This is what needs to be done. Eh, es más fácil. Ahorita, you need to have everything pronto, there ready to use. Cambiar. It's much easier if you do it that way. El, right now, it's just to... Que, pues, que mis padres me enseñaron de, to share this knowledge that my parents taught me. And I do it with great pleasure to share this information with you. A ver si se puede más. Ahora sí, Chris, por favor, me lo puedes traer? Let's see if we can do this. Chris, can you bring it over here, please? Please bring the wheelbarrow over here. Un poquito de agua. And then a little bit of water, too. Nomás échale un poquito nomás con el vaso. Con el vaso, échale un poquito. Echale. So you just have to put a little bit of water with that cup. Yeah, just a little. There you go. Put it in. There you go. That's it. That's it. Ahora, esto es lo que debe hacerse. En el lado se tiene que picar bien. This is what you have to do. Para que no quede poroso. The adobe, no you aire. really have to punch it out, move it around so it doesn't have porous, it doesn't, re any air doesn't remain in there. Y salga you un have adobe to move it around. Bueno, bonito, como usted lo so that quisiera, you get an adobe that turns bien. out nice the way that you would like it to turn out nice and neat.
y esto es lo, una construcción, una, una casita, también le puede servir para resguardar semilla, se, semilla is, original. Uh, can serve as like a little house to save the seeds, para que no se, to save the original no se seeds, the organic seeds, so de that they don't puede um, spoil. La casita. Yo había hecho, yo hice una casita personal. And in this way you can use the little shed for many things. I made a little mostrar. house. En realidad yo a little bit I'm going to show you para how it turned out. Nada más. Pero ya mi gente le I had made this little house like to be used as a shed. But now my people really liked it. They want me to make another one. To, oh, to add another room to it. But I will do it in the future. La familia. De todos se utilizan estos. You know, to please, to please the family, I'm going to do it. At any rate, you use all the material. You use everything from, from it. You use even if it comes out in halves. We don't waste anything. Todo es manual. Y se tra y trabajado. And everything is done manually. And it's worked que con esto hemos culminado y espero que, que hayan entendido uh, lo, la poca I believe this is la poca uh, experiencia this is que, it. We finished. I hope that you've been able to understand con, con the little experience that que quieran, que quieran I have been able to share with all my brothers and sisters por, por and por all acá, of por, you that want to learn and maybe someday del, you can come around y, here for a visit. Y me gustaría enseñarles ya más, más adelante más, to visit the house. más conocimiento. And maybe de later on I can share more, Gracias share more knowledge with buena you suerte para and other todos. experiences. So thank you. And good luck to all. Wonderful, wonderful video. Uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing that. And please send our thanks to Angel uh, when you see him later this evening. Uh, we really enjoyed the video and also the, the wonderful Yaki music uh, uh, towards the end. Um, Andrea, I don't know if there's anything else that you want to add before we move on to our next speaker. OK, I see that you're saying no. So right now, we're going to go to our next speaker, uh, Roberto Nutluis. He's uh, Dene. He's a traditional builder, and he's also calling in from Arizona. Uh, Roberto, when you are ready, please unmute yourself, and you have the floor.
<clears throat> Good morning. Can you guys hear me? All right, sweet. Uh, my name is Roberto and not Lewis. Uh, I'm the nephew from here, uh, from the community of Pinyan, uh, up here on Black Mesa. Uh, I'm Tudichini, bitter water, born for Putsoni, uh, big water. My maternal grandfathers are the Maidishkijni, who are the Hamas Pueblos, and my paternal grandfathers are Sweetwater, Tudikunje. Uh, in that way, greetings, my relatives. Um, we've been doing this uh, restorative economy program through an organization called Black Mesa Water Coalition. And our goal with that work was to revive the traditional knowledge and the traditional skills that are already embedded in our community, whether that's uh, food systems, uh, land restoration, land stewardship, and building. And through that work, we came across this, uh, the art of putting together our traditional homes, the, ho the hogans, we call them hogans. Uh, and that's been a very uh, uh, rewarding experience working with our young people, and one really took off and we got a lot of positive response from both communities and uh, the young people that participated in our in our work. One of the main, um, in, in terms of engaging with our communities and our elders, they always tell us about the need to uh, keep our traditional knowledge alive and passing that knowledge on to our young people. So I feel like uh, Hogan building is one of those ways to do that. Um, here in this photo, uh, again, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the uh, the processes, we harvest these logs, these are juniper logs. Uh, you have to understand where they come from in terms of the ecology that we have up here on Black Mesa. Uh, there's a very specific areas that we harvest these logs. Uh, we have prayers and offerings that are done before we harvest these logs. Uh, and it really teaches the young people about their ecology. You can't just go and select logs from anywhere. Uh, you have to understand where they grow. Uh, what conditions they're, 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 they're in. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, that one shows a ponderosa pine. Uh, Chris, can you uh, switch it to the next slide? So we use uh, two different species of wood, uh, juniper and ponderosa pine. Um, and, and again, the first part, is just harvesting it and uh, cleaning uh, the logs. And this is really important in terms of our interaction with our ecology. We have a lot of forest fires that are raging in Aboriginal homelands. So we've been utilizing these resources, these uh, <clears throat> um, in terms of construction. And since we've been removed from these places, uh, a lot of our forests are unhealthy. So when we collect these logs, we're actually thinning out the forest and improving the health of the forest uh, in these homelands. So here the, the young men are putting together the pillars um, and this is where we start from. Uh, we're building this uh, Hogan. Uh, it's a current project that we're working on out in Star School. Uh, and then in the background, you can see our Western Sacred Mountain. Another part of our work is also reclaiming spaces where we've been driven off of our homeland and putting up these structures again. So this is a real healing for our people to have these shout of and to really honor the, our sacred homelands. So this space is gonna be used for ceremonial purposes uh, to honor our homelands and our mountains uh, once it's completed. Uh, next slide. Can we get the next slide? Can you guys hear me? I don't know if, if I'm cutting out on my end. Hello? All right, sweet. Uh, I don't know if Chris is hearing me. All right, cool, there we go. So here we have Ponderosa pine uh, that we're putting on top of the juniper logs. Again, the juniper log is a, a hardwood, so it can go into the ground and it'll be uh, more resistant to uh, rotting, whereas pine is softwood, so we're using that for the roof structure. So here the young men are putting the roof structure together um, and the way we do this, this is all self-supporting beams. Uh, and then once you go in, once it's, it's complete, it's very mesmerizing just looking at the way it's put together. Uh, next slide. Can we get the next slide? 
Uh, and here, the, this is where we finish putting the roof together and all the pillars. Uh, the next step, we're gonna put the, the walls uh, around uh, the Hogan. And it, it's a lot of work and I'm really uh, proud of the young men that I work with. They're willing to work all the way, even when the sun goes down just to complete these projects. So again, the, it's really important to understand that our young people are very strong and very willing to learn and, and, and our, our, our very perseverance to the elements uh, that we work in. So I just decided to add this picture to, to demonstrate that. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Can we get the next slide? So again, here the young men are putting together the, the wall. Uh, we have different types of uh, hogan. This one is uh, called the mini lake hogan, hogan bajatana, because the, law, the walls are going up and down and uh, vertical or horizontal. Uh, there's other hogans where the logs go sideways. Uh, so, and then we also have a male hogan, but this is a mini lake hogan that we've uh, been able to revive in our community. Uh, and we've gotten a lot of requests to, to build these uh, across our homelands. Uh, next slide. I don't know if it's on my end. Um, all right, cool. So this is where we're at with the current project that we have with the Hogan. Right now, now we're letting the log sit like this for another month before we cover it with the dirt. But this is how it would look once you assemble the wooden structure. Um, yeah, next slide. Some of the things that we're doing uh, is also innovating with uh, how, how to build these structures. As you can see, there's a building wrap on the bottom of the logs. Uh, traditionally, our people didn't have building wrap back in the day, but now that we have that material technologies and new ways of doing things. So here, there's a wrap, so it's a moisture barrier wrap uh, to done. Uh, next slide. You can also see there's a chainsaw right there by the Hogan. We also use uh, uh, machines for that. Uh, right here, the young men are plastering the gaps in between the Hogan. Uh, and then we're uh, developing a stem wall. Uh, most of the time, the, 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 the earth that is covered over the Hogan reaches all the way to the ground. Uh, but that requires a lot of maintenance, uh, putting the dirt back on once it washes off uh, throughout the season. So we're, again, we do a lot of innovation to these traditional uh, architect. Uh, here, we're just doing a dry stack uh, stem wall using the local rocks so that it can hold up the dirt and it doesn't just melt into the ground. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this is how it looks once uh, we put all the logs together from the inside. And when you come into this kind of space, and as the first slide showed, when we talk about traditional knowledge, all of this, uh, serves a purpose in teaching that knowledge to our young people and all of those knowledge, whether it's the, 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 the different life forces and the energies that exist, the sacred mountains, it's all embedded in the teaching is embedded in this. And it's very uh, unique to have our medicine people, our elders come to these spaces and you know, share this knowledge to our community. So uh, that's what these buildings are serving as, as we build them is to a space to re reteach our young people. Uh, and this is how it looks. Uh, uh, once we put it all together and put the dirt back on. Uh, this one we built out in Cuba, New Mexico for the school. Uh, it now serves as a, as a space for, for, for Navajo kids. The, the school is off the reservation, but 70% of the students are Navajos. Uh, so this is a structure that we built again on school campuses. The irony is that, uh, that the schools where our students go, those are the spaces where our language and our way of life were being, uh, during the boarding school, uh, were being eradicated, but we're coming back to those very same spaces and reclaiming uh, spaces to teach our traditional knowledge. Uh, this Hogan we built uh, out at our site. We use this for our community organizing. We bring our young people, our community members to this place to talk about how do we, you know, the challenges that we see in our communities and what are the opportunities and 
how can we promote change in our community? So it's also a service as a community organizing space. Uh, next slide. Can you guys hear me? I get a uh, internet unstable on my end. I don't know if I'm coming through. Uh, here is uh, again the, the utilizing the space for the community to to bring people together to celebrate, uh, and also you see all these young people there. Uh, it's really important for them to experience this. I, I think a lot of times we just talk about traditional knowledge as something of the past, uh, but now we're bringing it into the present, and now our young people are experiencing what it looks like. They participated in how it was constructed, so it's a living memory. It's not something of a distant past, and I think that's really critical if our young people are to carry this knowledge forward that it has to be present and has to have meaning to their own experience so uh, creating these spaces and celebrating with the community uh, serves that purpose next slide as mentioned these spaces uh, we utilize it both for uh, celebrating and both for organizing and both for a ceremony uh, we had uh, my young niece that uh, reached her womanhood. Uh, Hogan is a very important place for the women to come in, the matriarch, to, you know, to embed wisdom and knowledge to these young women as they reach their womanhood. Uh, and all of the tools that are utilized, being a woman and, and playing that role as a matriarch. So, you know, it's a really beautiful space to, to reteach and to heal and to celebrate. Uh, and I think those moments in our communities. Next slide. And these are the young men that I've worked with over the years. Uh, my goal is to, to train them. Uh, right now, we're, we're working to build up their tools. We're buying them uh, power tools, a chainsaw, and setting them up with different folks that are interested in uh, these Hogans. I think the next work and the next challenge is creative financing. A lot of our people want to build this, but to pay our young men a, a fair wage uh, you know, we need to go into financing. So if there are people out there that know how to do creative financing, I'd love to hear from you guys. Maybe that could be a webinar of itself uh, because it does take resources. It does, it does take money to do this work. And a lot of times our communities are excluded from those financial institutions uh, that, that exists. Uh, and we need to do, we need to figure out other creative ways so that our people can be able to afford these structures. And again, we get a lot of calls uh, for these kind of homes from our from our community members, uh, but at times they can't really afford to pay our young men the fair wage. So we're kind of still, I think that's where we're at is figuring out how do we do this in a way that's affordable to our communities. At the moment, we are working with schools. A lot of our building projects are in, at schools that they get grants and are able to afford uh, to pay our young men uh, a fair wage. So that's where we're at with our construction and uh, hopefully this can serve as a way to rebuild and reconnect and give more employment to our young men. Uh, so that concludes my presentation. I think I went over. Yeah. Thank you so much, Roberto. It was really beautiful to see. I was also uh, mesmerized, as you said, when you showed the interior of the Hogan that was built by, by those young men. Really beautiful work. A lot of uh, really positive feedback uh, for the building going on in the chat. And uh, you know we'll come back just so folks know that after all of our presentations, we will open up for questions for all of our presenters. Uh, so right now I want to introduce our next and final uh, speaker for this segment. Uh, that's Radley Davis. He's from the Pitt River Nation. He's an IITC board member, and he is calling in from California. So Radley, when you're ready, please unmute, and you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Jimmy Sun Lee. Um, I'm a woodworker, uh, and I really honor the wood, and I'm just so thankful for what I've been able to learn and continue to learn. I'm Ilmawi, Pitt River, uh, Maidu, and Miwak on my father's side, and my mother, she's Winneman Wintu. And um, I've had the uh, honor to just learn from uh, different elders uh, with their knowledge about um, what's available out there in the in our homelands, and um, it's been it's been it's been a joy and continues to be. 
uh, what I'm going to talk about today is just some of the wood woodworking that I do. And I was going to be up in my canoe that I'm making for Pit River Tribe. I'm donating it, but it's snow. It's snow, a lot of snow up there right now. So, but what this presentation, getting ready for it, did it, it uh, got me going to. Um, I see that you see in my pictures. So that's uh, we got. Uh, there's the canoe. We got our young people there. See our chairman Mickey Gimmel's in there. Past chairman. He was in the one of the earlier slides too. Pretty cool. But we got the young folks um, coming in and using the ads and adding it out. Uh, this particular one we didn't burn out. Um, we used chainsaw, and um, that's a 18 foot. Uh, canoe there and but it's a cedar uh, cedar dugout we I go up and um, I look for down down cedar trees it's very hard if you gotta go look but over the years I've developed relationships with people uh, as well as with the forest service to um, get um, down logs for for um, canoe making I uh, see so got slides going on. There's other wood. There's some um, yew wood. Uh, so we got some yew wood uh, and my bows there. And uh, uh, one of the bows, the taller bow, that's actually a, a, a juniper, a sinew backed uh, recurve bow. And the, the one on the right is a Pit River sinew backed uh, bow. Um, uh, going out, there's another picture of. Uh, Here's, uh, you kind of get a little bit of the inside. We've got the heart. We have the lungs. The spine is covered up. Um, it's honor this, um, uh, this alive uh, relative. And of course we, we make offerings and sing our songs for the spirit of the tree and taking it from its homelands and, and, and taking care of it. So. There is um, a process of um, honoring uh, and talking to uh, this uh, sapi, it's, uh, which means canoe, but it's, um, um, uh, you know, just uh, learning and get um, young people to come and help and pass down what we can. Um, you know, it's, it takes time. It's something you can't do in a weekend. And, it does take time, and this here is my tenth canoe. I've I've uh, been part of making and sharing, and um, you know we people want more, and you're reviving this this uh, knowledge and these traditions, and it inspires our people to want to know more about who we are, and and of course our relationship to the land and and all the other things that our land provides for us. So. I like that part because I too got inspired by other people doing, uh, sharing this knowledge. So I, our, my, our teacher uh, come from over the mountains over in Hoopa, Porty Blake, he, he's our teacher uh, who started us out in bow making and, and working with the wood, but we uh, continued the, the knowledge, getting it from our, our elders at home. And what does it look like and how do we, you know, what's the interpretation? So. Uh, this here's an 18 and a half foot canoe here, dug out. We got a little tools there. They're using ads. Uh, we used uh, obsidian. Um, I haven't made an obsidian ads yet, but um, uh, but I have made uh, with some friends and ads. Um, but these tools we buy, they're really uh, good tools. They're expensive tools if you want to get good tools. But um, uh, clearing it out, but we, we've been burning out uh, canoes to this one. You can see a little bit of the burn marks in there in this one. So burn this one out. We're just taking out the burn there and uh, using ads, chipping away at it. And um, then I'll sand it down too. Well, if you flip it over, it's sanded down the other side. This here's some manzanita. Um, just because I work with wood, making uh, hair sticks, uh, making spoons, uh, mainly for making spoons. It's not old time traditional. It's just something that we incorporated when, uh, you know, colonization was beginning on us. But we took some of these ways that were brought to us and with a spoon and a fork and, and started re remaking those uh, with our uh, natural woods out there. So that's what this pile is, my pile of 
of manzanita that I pick up along the road and uh, you know collect and take care of and and wait for a project. Also, it's a way to kind of entice uh, people that want to work with with the um, wood. There you go. I wanted to show a couple of paddles. I just started uh, since I wasn't going to be able to go to the canoe. Um, I, I whittled out some um, quick paddles of cedar. Um, and uh, I was just about as tall as I am, I guess. I'm not very tall, but that's um, these two here. They'll go with that canoe, that picture you've been seeing. I'll give, you know, giving this to the tribe. And then, um, uh, you know, we've also, we got a 36 foot uh, canoe that we got back from a, a park up in Oregon. It's a large canoe and, and uh, you know, it's big. But it would just surprise me that we had a canoe that that big, and it's beautiful and it's it's like perfect. Uh, so it's it's continued to be inspiring, but um, we uh, still have yet to uh, sing um, for it and make a ceremony for it and uh, take care of it and bring it back to another place where it can be um, uh, you have a permanent home. Um, but it, it is back in Pitt River, just another part. Of an area that doesn't really have the the dugout cedar dugouts, we have tule tule boats too, and cedar dugout canoes. So different watercrafts. Um, uh, I, you know, there's evidence that we used uh, yellow pine to make a dugout. I look forward to making a dugout with yellow pine. Um, and I want to show uh, uh, this piece of wood here that um, uh, put this away here on the side but um so it's like for example here's a piece of um you wood this here's a hard wood but the interesting thing about this um you wood this really hard wood it's also water wood and uh our people very like scientific like how can you make a bow out of hardwood how are you gonna get the, the bend this here's like a little blank you know another one just kind of blanking it out you know, trim it down, right? And then um, let's uh, let me start. Oh, here's one right here. So then I start uh, whittling it down to shaping it more, more of a better blank. You can see my picture here. This is all you would here. So, and then we get another one. It's a little bit more sanded down, a little bit more. Uh, I put a little oil on this one, uh, so that's why that's why the color pops out pretty good. So there's a little curve that I steam this, steam this with some steam, and uh, bend it. And like I was right here, I, I learned this with my teacher, and it's something that when I leave with the canoe, and even with the bow, just uh, taking your hand and just to shape, feeling the shape of it, knowing where you gotta you know, take it down a little bit. And then you, you begin to have that relationship with the wood and uh, it's just something you feel uh, hard, not really, you can explain it, but until you feel it, have that aha moment as you begin to work and honor uh, this uh, wood that it really starts to make sense, you know. Then a uh, arrow, there's a cedar, a cedar, a piece of cedar cut out and then I make an arrow. Right, and uh, it's got a little bit of design right there. Stop and don't go too fast for you. Uh, I love this. I wish, uh, I shouldn't say I wish, I do do it. Uh, I have a job I go to and uh, I, get, I get lost in working in the, in, the, in the land and working on things. So here's a bow already made. So I've seen you, seen you back here. This is about 50, 50, 50 pounds pressure, very powerful. It'll drop a deer fast. It's, it's very powerful and fast. It's, it's a little bit longer too, because our bows are about 42 inches long. Uh, and this one here is um, about 52 inches long. Um, got some sinew right there on there. But um, the, the dugouts, um, uh, 
taking out of the woods. We, we do a lot of stuff by hand. And so we don't use any heavy equipment uh, because we don't want to impact the land. Uh, uh, but we some places we can't take anything with, take it out by hand. I'll whittle a blank dugout right there in the mountains. But it's it's hard to, to um, uh, if you got to go deep into the woods to get a log, I, I'll probably go look at it and then decide if it's something I want to get. But uh, but it's, it's a long process. And um, I have now a relationship with the forest services, the three forest services around the area who I, I work with. And I've used uh, the, the, my tribe, Pit River Tribe, to have them uh, as a way to support um, those folks uh, getting traditional materials in the forest for our work and, and, and letting them know what we're doing. And then, um, you know, just working with um, different entities and using different laws as well um, to help us uh, gather material. So um, uh, I learned this more of an older age um, as I was being inspired by the places I got to travel. And um, so uh, part of learning um, of just pieces of what I'm sharing with you is to give back and to, uh, that's the power of how we keep these alive is to um, share. And, um, and I have, uh, I've developed patience over the years, but I, I know sometimes, you know, uh, uh, some of my crew don't come back for a while, you know, and they got a nice good blank if on the bow or something, but I enjoy um, uh, taking people out in the forest and, and sharing what I know. And then it's nice to take out uh, our chief or other knowledgeable people who uh, will can, will share even more things, you know, out there and uh, foods and plants out in the, the woods and how we honor um, uh, everything, how we're connected to it. Um, uh, so um, I don't know how long it takes to build a canoe because uh, I've just, we've taken time. We've had 40 people and just going and just getting down and making canoes you got you got to think of safety and, you know, we use chainsaws too. We're out in the woods or well, so we do use chainsaws, but, um, and other tools. I, I brought one tool. Uh, this was given to me, uh, ads. I've never used this. I look forward to using it, but tools like this, that it's a, uh, here's a curved ad here, a little bitty one. It's heavy. This will, I, I believe this will really eat some wood up, but there's, um, tools you need and and you need to know how to use these tools because they could be very dangerous very sharp um, but, but when you burn out the dugout um, it's really clean really um, uh, you know you burn it out right you know you and it just really takes time and and you begin to feel that relationship when you're working with um, the wood and um, and singing songs and um, then if there's people around telling stories, you know, and it's a chance to uh, be an example for our people and showing them and letting them participate in it. A lot of people like to take the wood when they come and the young people say, if I could take a chip with me, well, I've had elders that want a chip too, or want me to carve them out a little bitty canoe, you know, give me some good ideas, you know, any, any way to inspire our people um, to um, continue to work with our traditions. So, um, uh, but I, I'm really honored I was able to share just a little bit about what I'm what I'm part of and doing, and I look forward to uh, sharing more. And and certainly, uh, if you're ever up in Pitt River Country in our way, uh, I'll be glad to show you our canoes, and maybe maybe we'll go out in the water and scoot around a little bit. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you, Natalie, for that uh, really beautiful presentation and sharing your work and those photos uh, showing the engagement of the community, really fascinating. And uh, again, a lot of good comments coming in the chat uh, about your presentation. Uh, some questions already, you know, uh, like, like the others, I, I really appreciated this idea of, you know, really getting back, connecting with the land, how, how we do those things to, to reinvigorate our, our traditions, keep them going. But also you showed, uh, as uh, Roberto did and others, you know, how really this can also be used to inspire the youth. And um, I know there's a question right on that, but uh, I, 
you know, I've had the honor, Radley, if you remember, uh, to, to be out your way and you showed me some of those canoes and, you know, as a, as a person coming from a, a canoe culture, the, the word canoe comes from the Taino language, kanoa. Uh, we really, uh, really appreciate that. And when you said you had that one for 36 people, it reminded me of one of those um, accounts uh, when in the early colonization period where uh, they would talk about our, our kanoa being able to hold 150 people. So, you know, you're talking about really strong. You think about the trees and the environment that our folks worked in, just just beautiful. And you inspired that memory for me. So I, I say how home once again. Thank you. So right now, uh, we really want to open it up and, and uh, engage in a little bit of dialogue uh, with our panelists. Uh, let's see here. I know there was one that came. Uh, here's one uh, to Roberto and, and really all the panelists. This is from Andrea. She said, there's an urgent need. We have heard uh, so many places, uh, from so many places for our tribes to provide employment uh, to our young people to learn and practice their traditional life ways, building, weaving, planting, carving, etc. Has any, has, uh, any of the panelists, uh, Roberto and all, uh, besides what Roberto was saying about, you know, this, uh, you know, financial uh, some kind of uh, financial training, uh, financing training, rather. Uh, are there any ideas how we can, uh, you know, generate funds or, or employment ideas to get uh, youth involved more in these practices? This is open to any of the panelists. Uh, this is Wilberto. I'm sorry I got knocked off uh, earlier. Um, to that question, uh, creative financing. Um, one of the things we're doing is uh, we've been working with the Hopi Titsqua, and they've been able to secure some investment funds where they are utilizing it to help build homes using traditional knowledge uh, and young people in it. Um, so we're kind of uh, looking at how they evolve their loaning, the, the loan programs that they've established um, so I think I'm not too familiar with financing. That's why I was saying like, I think there's a real need for training, but also to develop our own ways of financing these initiatives in our communities and that, that it can take root and really build a local economy. So I think this is where we need more uh, business people that can get involved in helping us to shape uh, not only policies, but how can our people have access to the resources needed to do these activities and these uh, and sustain these life ways. Um, so that's the only one that I could look at is uh, Hopi Titsqua and some of their, their innovative ways of financing, helping families finance their home. Uh, and they're not really going through, your, through their traditional banks. Um, so, and I know there's other initiative like the, um, what do they call that? Uh, Community Development Corporation. Um, Community Financial Institution, CDFI. I, I think those are the two that we've looked at when I was working with Black Mesa Water Coalition. That those are ways that we can try to uh, develop internal uh, financing capacity uh, to, to carry this work forward beyond just projects and grants. So I think there's a lot of research and a lot of innovation that could come into continuing to dive into the financing side. Uh, and hopefully we can get a lot of our young people that are going into colleges, into these business realms to come back um, and, and really help us develop that. Uh, and one that's not based on exploitation of workers uh, or also of, of natural resources, that's how capitalism works. So I think we really need uh, insightful people that can really help us shape uh, financial systems that is made for our people and by our people. Uh, so that's what I'd like to contribute. Thank you so much, uh, Roberto. We really appreciate that that uh, perspective and, and what you had to share there. Are there any others uh, who are on the panel or who want to take a crack at that question about how do we uh, build this? Oh, I see Andrea raising her hand. I see Peter Ucapicio with her. Yes. <clears throat> 
it just so happens that um, our tribal chairman uh, for Pascoyaki tribe, um, Peter Yucopicio, came in to pick up some um, mass and hand sanitizer we had for our ceremonial participants um, that we got donated. Uh, but he would like to respond to that question of how can tribal nations support um, uh, indigenous young people to keep these life ways alive. I notice. I know that uh, we've talked about, you know, if, if our young people, we want them to go to school and if they learn to be an accountant or a nurse or a lawyer, they probably have a job coming back to the tribe. They would be welcome. But what about if they're traditional farmers or adobe makers or canoe carvers or Hogan makers? How, how can our tribes provide support for young people to do that kind of work that is really essential to keep going? So so Peter wanted to comment on that, if that's OK. Yeah. Good. Welcome, Peter. Good to Hello, see you. and first of all, to all our brothers and sisters and our extended family through these forms of media, it's, it's, it's actually an honor stopping by today here at Indian Treaty and then listening a little bit, you know, Mr. Davis, on how the traditions of making the canoes and that, that, must, that must stay alive no matter what, what the means or modernization of today's world's like. You know, I, I was reminded when you guys were talking, how do we, how do we uh, infuse and how to include and how to uh, do uh, things that would benefit the youth. And my, my sons were going to um, a local school here, actually the big school in town called Tucson High. And one day the teacher calls me and says, but I've noticed your son has missed on certain dates. And then I told her, yes, he, he has missed. And if you notice the record, I excused him from school. And then she said, was he sick or was he, um, what was the matter? And I said, you know, those are the days that through our faith and through our culture and through our beliefs, he has to contribute and be part of a ceremonial uh, society and, and, and serve there. And it was those days that I think when I look at it now, if we do not do those things for our youth, even as parents or as cultural leaders or tribal leaders, then because uh, I write many letters for youth participation from their local schools and even people from work to see if they would exercise the right for them to dance, the right for them to carve, the right for them to paint, the right for them to sing, the right for them to, to do those things as youth. A long time ago, when I was a, a young soldier in one of our societies, the elders were worried of what's going to happen to us. Are the kids in the future going to be able to do this or not? And it was in those years that the 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 big gangs like you know, the ones of color, the ones that claim the blue color, the red color, all that stuff was very strong. And I said, if we do not allow or include our youth in our ceremonial way of life, then they will probably head to those areas there to be part of that. And the nice thing is that within time, and I'm talking from the 60s to now, our ceremonial societies are so big and so strong that towards the end of our Lenten season, there's thousands, not hundreds, but thousands throughout these Arizona communities filled with youth that participate. And some of us now have become elders and we, we're the ones that are teaching them. Just yesterday, um, I was there, uh, we were, we were um, making a ceremonial mass for us a cultural participant and the two children that he brought were sitting there watching and they were asking questions. And I thought it was so beautiful that they even asked, you know, how do we prepare this? How do we know it's, it's the right way to do this and all that. And, and a lot of us that were in there, which are now becoming our, our elders there in that ceremonial setting uh, answered a lot of their questions. And I think that's what they want. They want the engagement of somebody listening to them and somebody including them and then including them in, in prayer and thought. So other than that, you know, blessings to everybody and 
as we as a nation here at Pascoyaki tribe look towards more and more involvement of our of our culture and and our language and everything else uh, we actually invest pretty well in making sure that that department of language and culture and i invite any of you to contact mr danny vega and also uh learn and 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 see some of the things that we're doing as a tribe to preserve our culture to preserve our beliefs and that's that's what i wanted related and it was so beautiful watching those pictures of of the boat making and and the carving and the the bows and arrows because uh, we also did a trip to the smithsonian institute and there are bows there that belong to yaquis that are before uh, the conquest years and that is a beautiful thing to see when you see those bows and the 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 arcs and all those that are built by uh, our members and by hand so thank you very much and it was truly a blessing to to th share thought and prayer and and this this uh way because andrea was telling me that i missed the presentation from angel but you know some of us as children we were building our adobes we were actually the kids that were thrown in the pit and once the grass was thrown in we were all jumping in there having fun and all that stuff but we were actually part of the adobe making when we were five eight ten years old so it, it was beautiful actually to, to know that Angel was still doing that and teaching the Adobe uh, craft. So thank you and blessings. Thank you so much, Chairman Yucapicio, for being with us and sharing those beautiful words. Got a lot of good uh, good responses in the chat for your presence and for everything that you had to share. Uh, really important, and and I. I'm really happy also that you highlighted the ceremonial connections to all of this. Radley did that and and, and uh, Roberto did that and others, you know, connecting that idea of continuing these 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 activities, but also that they are connected to ceremony, just as we're connected to the, the environment. We're really beautiful. Um, I don't know if any of the other uh, panelists, uh, Radley, uh, Rodney, uh, if you want to add anything that you, maybe you felt that uh, you you just feel might want to you want to enhance uh, what you shared earlier, or maybe you remembered something else based on uh, some of the other things that were shared. If you feel that there's some other words uh, that you can impart, uh, we're certainly open to that. Uh, and uh, for those who are listening in, please, if you can, uh, type your your questions into the chat so that we could share them. But I, I see the chat has been very active. There's been folks who are talking about everything from crowdfunding to finding other ways to, to grants, to, to National Endowment for the National Council of the Arts, Endowment uh, and Arts, et cetera. There's a lot of interesting information there. Uh, so I would, I would recommend people just peruse that or, or look through that uh, as, you, as you have time. But uh, Rodney or Radley, did you want to add anything else to considering this all this other uh, information that has been shared? I'm good. I appreciate. Yeah, Just appreciate right. everybody. But I'm good. Unless is well, maybe um, I don't know if Andrea knows this, but I, I did notice and. Uh, you know, we talk about the use of, the, of modern tools and some and some of this stuff. Oh, I see Rodney, come, Rodney coming on. Did you want to add something, Rodney? Uh, no, I just want to say that I appreciated everybody's participation and uh, the presenters. And uh, I'm just, uh, uh, I don't know, it's unfortunate. Like I said, we had a storm coming in, weather, you know, here, and uh, it's kind of cleared up some, but my computer kept going off. And But, yeah, I just, uh, you know, it's just good to hear that, you know, a lot of people are still using uh, the same techniques that their ancestors used to, to create, you know, these, these beautiful things, uh, the uh, canoes and uh, the adobe and those kind of things. And uh, I'm always uh, uh, willing to learn those things because our people used a lot of that. And, and like I said, the chickies, you know, they were made from the natural resources that they had there and, uh, they uh, uh, helped our people to survive uh, that policy of extermination, you know, where they moved from camp to camp and were 
able to to build shelter you know even though it was temporary and uh it became permanent you know after the seminal wars for a lot of those that remained there and uh it served their you know their purpose on uh in survival but you know uh, it was a pleasure for me to uh, take part in this and uh good blessings to all Hello. Wado, Hahom, Rodney, and Radley for, for those comments. You know, I, I just, uh, it, it just made me think, you know, about, uh, you know, where we are in some, in like, you know, Rodney, when you were sharing the, the building of the Chiquis and, and how, you know, it's more of a bringing back, I'm thinking about, uh, back into my own homelands where, you know, still in so many areas, that knowledge, that indigenous knowledge has been transferred to the local communities and they are still building. And, and it's because of the, you know, the poverty structure, right? I, I mean, the, in one way, you know, people were building and still continuing to build those houses in that form because it, it might be cheaper for them than engaging in the, the, the more modern style housing. Uh, but, you know, as we, as things come in and more of this modern style comes back, it's interesting to see us reverting back uh, to the old ways once again. So it's it just to add some some thought uh, into my mind about uh, relooking, and I think uh, some of you have mentioned that just relooking at uh, some of our of our techniques and and uh, is it you know really the value of them and 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 the long and the longevity uh, of those systems. Now I'm looking to see if there's any any other uh, comments or or questions. I don't see uh, any other questions. There is, as I said before, there is a lot of uh, comments that, uh, that we're talking about financing opportunities, you know, recycling. Uh, all of these things are coming to the chat. If you want to save the chat, I think uh, what you're able to do is, if you look at the you have the chat open uh, you'll see a little box that has three dots uh, at the bottom you can click on that and it's a save chat so I think that uh, I'm not sure if everyone can do this but I know that at least the the presenters and, and some others can can you could let me know if uh, you know those who are attendees can also do that but um, okay so you can I see somebody said they can't so I, I wonder if there's a way that if we download the chat, we might be able to upload it to our uh, ITC website uh, in some of the materials that we've been sharing from the webinars. So let's see if we can do that. Check back again. Uh, ITC website is a good uh, resource uh, to follow up on, on these webinars. Uh, contact us if, if folks haven't shared there. Um, yeah, the presenters can select all in the chat and copy it into a Word document. So we can probably get the Word document up at IITC to share so that people, uh, you know, might want to relook at this chat at another point and see some of the good ideas that were presented. Um, let's see. I, I, I see a question coming in here or a comment uh, that says um, from G. Uh, Delphister, I, I hope I pronounced that right. Says, I know this is probably a stretch, but it seems like the U.S. federal politicians are looking to create a green economy, and with Deb Haaland's help, maybe there's an opportunity to fund with federal money these projects. Ha has anyone had ideas related to something like this or ideas under the green economy? So that's one comment that came in, uh, linking these ideas to the talks about uh, the green economy, the Green New Deal, and, and this. But I, I think some of our, our presenters did mention that you know, you're working with the tribal governments is a way to, to uh, kind of more uh, mainstream or stabilize this, at least stabilize this, at least within the community. Andrea, I see you getting on, so that must mean you, you want to share something. Um, yes, just for the presenters here, um, and if you have videos or or even we are making, we're recording this in both Spanish and English, and just to let people know, it will be on the website and also the video uh, that we made of Angel making the adobe will be separately posted on the IITC website 
which is iitc.org. And we have a special section uh, for these webinars. So everyone will be able to um, access that. And I'm not sure if it's on our webpage or if it's linked uh, to uh, YouTube, but there's a way to access not just this one, but the other practical knowledge sharing um, webinars that we've done. Uh, and um, I think, you know, this is also something that you know, we're seeing, I guess, on the international level, especially around uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, you all probably know, but I'm the co-chair of this year of a UN body called Local Communities Indigenous Peoples Platform. And it's, they're, they're doing the same thing as, as many of our tribes and even the outside society is doing is recognizing how much Indigenous people's traditional knowledge and practices uh, really are geared to um, ensuring that we're able to, to sustain our, our lives and survival in this time of climate change. And I think that all of the presentations today showed that these are energy efficient using uh, local resources. Um, and, and in the case of our adobes, you know, th those are buildings that don't require, even in the desert, you know, air conditioning or heating because they, they stay, you know, temperature balanced because of the makeup of the adobe. So um, these are things I think that are getting a lot of attention. And it's up to us to decide what we want to share. Some of our sacred knowledge, of course, we're not going to share it. But um, these kinds of, of um, techniques and knowledge are beginning to be really recognized so finally, you know, and respected um, at the United Nations as well. So uh, we do have a website and a portal for this UN body if anybody has something they would like to submit and be posted is also another way to possibly look for funding um, internationally, because sometimes in other countries outside uh, the US, like in Europe, there is other kinds of funding support for these sorts of projects. So those things you're willing to share, um, I think, you know, we can we can get them uh, posted uh, on a UN website if you're interested. I'll just, you know, just email me if you would like to. It's Andrea at treatycouncil.org uh, if you would like to post any of your information and share it um, globally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. We have a question uh, or a comment uh, from Frank Edowajizik, Elder Frank Edowajizik. I don't know, Chris, if there's a way to uh, allow him to to speak. Yeah, there uh, is. If you can change his. Okay, Frank, uh, you're able to to talk now. Okay, thank thank you very much. I, I really appreciate all the the panelists today and all the the information. I do want to have a word of caution. I mean, we're talking about uh, in in terms of, of preserving our traditional ways. We're talking about trying to use state or federal money, even international money. We're talking about these kind of things being brought in. And to me, while those things, if used wisely, those things can be helpful, it's not good to have our traditions become dependent on outside money. They need to be within our communities. Mm -hmm. And we need every way we can possibly do this, support this with our families getting together and uh, supporting those who are we're teaching. And, and keeping, you know, finding ways to do that within our, with the community resources, even though they're meager, we've always done it that way. And we try to figure out ways to do that because as soon as we, uh, as soon as we rely on outside money for something, you get a program and then people start getting paid for doing it. And then after a while I say, well, I'm not getting paid anymore. I'm not going to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's really a danger. And I think we need to be, we need to be careful about that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That's why, you know, we're really looking, like Peter talked about, at tribal support, because these are our life ways. We may not even want to share them outside. You know, I, I know these are things that, that our participants have decided they could share and want to share, but I agree with the idea of especially federal funding um, for, for these ways. The problem is, is that, you know, our, our young people, 
need to find a way to support themselves. They're starting families. And, you know, so I really, I really think we need to pressure our tribal, tribal governments, you know, to, to support within our communities, you know, and, and people's, um, our young people coming back and, and bringing these ways. Like I said, if you go to university and you become a nurse or an accountant or a lawyer, you can probably find a job in your tribe coming back. But what about if you're a traditional carver or a, a canoe maker or a weaver? Um, you know, is that support there? So these are some things I agree we need to talk about internally as well um, and see, you know, see what can be done. Otherwise, our young people are going to go off and work somewhere else and, you know, not see the, the importance or the need to keep these, these things going or not be able to really. So thank you. I agree with you. Everything you said, Frank, so I do. Thank you so much, Andrea, for that. And for Frank, uh, for adding that uh, bit of wisdom at the end. I would just also like to add, you know, we have to think about the knowledge holders too. how, you know, we talk about giving youth employment, but how also do we sustain these knowledge holders when they have to also work and take care of families and to get them to show them to show the youth and work with youth. So I, I think that there's a a real balance that that has to be achieved in that but you know I also support that idea of self reliance. So with that I think that's about all the time we have today uh, for questions and comments it's it's been a really uh, a vibrant dialogue here not only uh, between us who have been talking but also in the chat and that's really uh, wonderful to see. I just want to remind folks that this series still continues. We have about uh, at least three more programs uh, going to happen moving forward. And next week, uh, same time, same place, as they say, uh, we'll be coming back with a discussion on restoration of the health of our soil. Very important uh, discussion. We'll have speakers uh, from Mexico, Guatemala, and Arizona, and uh, possibly other places. So we just really hope that, uh, you know, as you uh, registered uh, for today's uh, webinar, you know, that you can also register for the upcoming webinars as well. Check out our IITC website, uh, look and click on uh, events or trainings, webinars, you get right to the webinars, look at the calendar, and you will be able to register. And remember the IITC website is a bilingual website uh, so that you will be able to access it in English also and in Spanish. So, uh, you know, hopefully that will also assist in, in uh, expanding the outreach of our work and, and also your opportunity to participate with IITC. So with that, I want to uh, just once again say ha -hom. thank you to all of our presenters today. Uh, Radley Davis, Roberto Nutluis, uh, Rodney Factor, uh, just Angel Valencia and uh, Andrea, of course, uh, as always, everyone, and also Frank Edowajizic for adding uh, some commentary, Chairman Peter Ucapicio for coming in and adding some commentary, and of course, to all of you who have added comments and, and have continued to support this program uh, uh, through this phase. Thank you to our interpreters. Uh, Rebecca and Jimmy, and also thank you to Chris Honani for uh, all his work in getting this all together uh, every week for us. Uh, my name's Roberto Mucaro Borrero. I just want to say Seneco Kakona, abundant blessings to all of you, and I look forward to seeing you uh, next week uh, for our next uh, webinar presentation on restoring the health of our soils. Thank you. Uh, home.